I love the chase and the hunt and I set the pace when I'm running. I always take what I want and I always give it 100. Don't need a bank, no, I'm funded. Play the game like it's nothing. I'm always thankful for something. Don't take for granted, stay humble. Now waiting, better believe in your mind cause it's everything. You can mold, shape, find almost anything. Hey everybody, this is Praxis. In this video, I wanna talk about the growing nature of the kinetic conflicts that we're seeing around the world, uh, how that is tying in with the, you know, the beginning of World War III, people keep talking about, and where I see things going over the next year or two years. Before we get into this, because I think this is a really important question, it uh, is fundamental to a lot of people's prepping plans, in at least in terms of their timing, uh, I think it's important to talk about the nature of conflict and the nature of fighting itself. A lot of people in the Western world, in America in particular, I think are not really good at fighting. Uh, that's not to say people don't get engaged in fights all the time. You know, it's like, you know, Christmas and people are at department stores and they're like, you know, slapping at each other, fighting over, uh, you know, different gifts or whatever. Uh, you know, th there's plenty of violence that crops up in our society. Uh, so there are a lot of fights that happen, but I don't think most people are very good at fighting. Now, uh, with me saying that, I think a lot of you guys, one of the first things that's gonna pop in your head is like, what, this guy is gonna be preaching to us about like how to be a more effective fighter? It's like, you know, Praxis, you, uh, you know, you're great, but you know, you don't strike me as being like some kind of like a UFC cage match ultimate champion or whatever. Um, and that's the point. That's the point. To be an effective fighter, one of the best ways to win a fight is to make it so that your adversary doesn't even realize they're engaged with you in a fight to begin with. The best fighting is hidden. The best fighting is secret. The best fighting is the type of fighting that you engage in where because your opponent doesn't even realize they're engaged in it with you, they don't have their defenses up, or at least they don't have them up to the degree that they would if it became an open, clear situation where I am fighting this person and I am ready for it. So the most effective way that you can win a fight is to make it so that your opponent doesn't even have any awareness that a fight is is ongoing. And that is what I think we're seeing a lot in the world right now is that there is a war going on. You might want to call it war, World War III. I don't think the idea of titling wars and giving them numbers is kind of legitimate because uh, conflict isn't something that like be, has a beginning, middle, and an end. It just flows and flows and flows through the generations. So the idea of uh, compartmentalizing things into number one, number two, number three, I don't think is very legitimate. But in terms of like, is there a World War III about to happen? Well, the idea is that it's happening right now, but it's not being fought in the way that a lot of people expected to see it fought. It's being fought in a way that is effective for the players that are involved. Now, what are the players? The players on the world stage are, you know, the United States, Russia is a player, China is obviously a major player. There are other players there uh, as well, but those are kind of like the major players. Now, you have uh, Russia and China, which are kind of ascendant powers. You know, they uh, had been weaker in the at least recent past, and they're gaining in strength at this uh, time. You know, as every year, as every decade goes by, you know, they become stronger and stronger and stronger. The United States is sort of the on the opposite side of that, where, you know, our our time in the sun uh, see, feels like it was kind of in the past. You know, we had that moment and we've been kind of uh, diminishing in terms of our debt to GDP ratio and, you know, our influence on the world stage. Uh, you know, we are definitely uh, not in, in an ascendant situation, but more in a descendant situation. And the other players must realize that. Uh, China in particular is a real long game kind of country. Uh, you know. It, you know, in the way that their politics is set up, they don't, they don't have to work constantly on like, you know, the president to president four year election cycle. You know, they think in terms of generations. And if you're China and you're watching, you know, your potential adversary, the United States, sitting on the playing field, essentially bleeding out, what is your incentive to, you know, walk up to that player who, you know, we might be concealing a knife, you know, we might look really tired, but maybe we got like a couple good lunges left in us. There's no real incentive for China in this case to try to bring things to a kinetic level because the situation on the ground, just the slow bleeding of time is working in their favor. And the same is true for Russia, where they are ascendant, they are making more connections out around the world. You know, their economy is doing pretty well, you know, despite all the sanctions that have been put on them, uh, they've got a lot of resources and they are utilizing a lot of that. And they are in that other kind of ascendant position where, you know, with the conflict uh, going on in uh, Ukraine, while they're pouring a lot of material and capital into that conflict, 
the people that are on the other side of that conflict that are also pouring in material and capital are bleeding at a rate that seems to me, and I think probably to a lot of the major players, to be a more severe rate of bleed out than the Russians are. So in that kind of a situation between the two, time is on their side. And when time is on your side, there's no real reason, if you're good at fighting, to go and try to, trying to change the status quo. And turning the kind of conflict that we have right now, which is sort of like a, a slow burning, war of attrition kind of proxy kind of conflict, trying to turn that into something bigger, doesn't play into the hand of the adversaries of the United States in this situation. So I see no, I see no reason why those adversaries would choose to do that because the situation right now is great for them. Now, if this conflict that we're seeing develop across the world is going to go to a much more kinetic, uh, you know, much more violent, uh, bigger level, who's the player that is most likely to try to initiate that? Well, that would be the player that is bleeding out. If you are the person where you're slowly getting weaker and weaker and the longer things go on, you have less strength and less ability to compete with these ascendant forces, you have every incentive to try to make that conflict happen as soon as possible. So if we are to see some sort of uh, you know, rapid escalation of things, where that would come from, I would, I would hypothesize, and by hypothesizing, I don't, I'm not saying that I would prefer this or that I like this idea or that I want this to happen, but I would hypothesize the most likely source of a big game change in this conflict would be coming from the United States because they have uh, the most to lose by not going that way, especially with the presidential election coming up and honestly just the most to gain uh, from things going in that direction because uh, the longer a large conflict is, is held off, uh, the, the weaker the hand that the United States is gonna have when that, if and when that ends up occurring. So how would, how would that play out? Uh, well, like looking at American history, the tendency in American history when we want to get you can't really always infer what people want, this is all kind of guesswork, but it, when it is in the it's when it is in the perceived advantage of the United States to get into a conflict, or at least it's in the perceived advantage of the people in power in the United States to get into a, a, some sort of a conflict, the way that that usually comes about isn't by the United States just uh, you know, outright marching and being a really clear aggressor. The way that they usually do that, and you guys probably know this from your history, is that there is some sort of an event that we either uh, manufacture or create uh, the situations for which it becomes extremely likely or you know something's happening and we just simply sort of step out of the way and allow it to happen. Uh, we create a situation, manifest a situation, allow to happen a, a situation where the United States uh, you know becomes some sort of a victim. And we've seen this many times throughout uh, American history. Uh, there was a rallying cry, remember the Maine. Was that for the Mexican-American war? war? I, can't, I can't quite remember. We, use, we do use this technique so frequently. There was uh, the Maine uh, that was sunk. Uh, there was um, uh, the, you know, the Gulf of Tonkin uh, you know, uh, related to uh, uh, the Vietnam War. Oftentimes 9-11 is cited as another one of these examples, you know, whether that was something where the United States did kind of stand down and allow that to happen, or if it was a complete surprise to the people in power, which is a little bit, a little bit hard to fathom, but I guess it could be possible. But what is, indisput what is indisputable is the fact that when, when it happened, however it happened, whatever the circumstances were that it happened, it was used as a rallying cry to get us into conflicts that uh, not arguably, definitively had nothing to do with uh, you know, the people that were involved in that, you know, like going into Iraq and all that. But the idea is that the United States tends to allow to happen or create or be, be surprised by situations that uh, arise and cause them to feel to be a victim. And once that happens, they use that as a rallying cry to get their population on a war footing, and then they go forward. And I would suspect, I would suspect that that is what we're going to see this time, where some kind of an event is going to pop up and the United States is going to you know, say that we were a victim of something. A lot of people are suggesting that that might be one of the reasons why the United States is packing so many uh, military vessels uh, into the, uh, the Middle East area and the, you know, the waters around Yemen uh, in, to a density that just doesn't seem to serve any kind of strategic or tactical purpose uh, other than potentially offering up some of these vessels as being the next main, uh, you know, to be taken down so that we can use that as a rallying cry 
you know, to, uh, you know, to bring this to that kinetic level. Because at the moment, again, we're sitting on the field, we're bleeding out, uh, time is not on our side. The people in power in the United States, I think, are aware of this. And, you know, they need that kind of catalyzing moment uh, in order to be a bit of a game changer. Now, as to whether or not uh, th that change in the game uh, allows the United States to become ascendant again, uh, it's hard to say because when you get into these kind of kinetic uh, fights, things become much more unpredictable. So it's, it's hard to say what, w whether that will work in the United States' ultimate favor or whether that will just make whether that will exacerbate and accelerate the demise of the United States, it's really hard to say. But what can be said for certain is that we are bleeding out on the field right now. The adversary, our adversaries must be aware of that. And there is no incentive for our adversaries to bring this conflict to that kind of next level. So if and when we have this kind of catalyzing event where the United States is victim, you know, seen as a victim because something's gonna happen to us, I think. Um, it's important to think at that moment because there are major players on the world stage that are going to have the finger pointed at them, like Saddam Hussein was. Uh, and that event is going to be used to uh, mobilize and motivate the United States population to get ourselves into a conflict that is gonna be very pro profitable for a lot of people and it's gonna be very uh, costly in terms of the lives and blood of a lot of other people. I think that is likely that is going to happen. And when it happens, I think it's important to keep in mind that the people who are likely to be blamed for that are parties that do not benefit from that situation and very likely were not involved in it. And the situation just being used in order to motivate people like we did to invade Iraq. So I think it is important to just keep that in mind because uh, the American people who are passionate but we're very easy to manipulate. <laughs> you, you get us to uh, be convinced that you know, we were victimized in some way, people just turn their brains off, and uh, well, I, I've been through so many of these situations where people like myself uh, that talk rationally about this, uh, you know, we're, I'm, in the future I'm going to be described as being unpatriotic because I'm gonna be suggesting the things that I am right here, like is this actually in our interest? Do we know what's gonna uh, come out of this? You know, is the, uh, is the price of this going to be worth what we you know, are hoping to achieve with this? Uh, that is really looked down on in the past. Uh, and over and over again, I see the cycle. Uh, I see it coming up again. And uh, it wouldn't really bother me personally uh, if people actually learned from this. Uh, you know, I, lo I look back at the last few years with COVID, like the, the response of a lot of people, I think was really embarrassing. And I think a lot of people deserve to be embarrassed by the way that they reacted to the COVID situation. And that would be great if people could actually learn from it, <laughs> you know, where uh, it could be a situation where people could recognize the mistakes that they've made in the past and uh, you know, use that to make better decisions in the future. But unfortunately, it's not the way that it tends to work. People have very short memories. They forget that they ever kind of were hoodwinked in the past. And when we become the victims of whatever this next uh, you know, attack is going to be, and I put it in quotes because, you know, it might, might be a false flag, it might be legitimate, it might be one of those situations where the United States just kind of lets some, there's always some crazy nut job willing to do something, you know, they just kind of let them through. You know, whatever the nature of it's going to be, when it happens, people are going to click, turn off those brains, and uh, allow themselves to be used like they always do. That's it. That's what I'm looking for over the next year or so is that situation where uh, something is used in order to create a, uh, a change in the situation because the situation as it is right now does not favor the continued power structure of the United States because uh, we're slowly bleeding out and other people are ascendant and um, I think we are going to be the ones that are going to want to change that and we're going to do that by seeing ourselves as a victim and convincing enough of our population that we were a victim. That's it. Thanks for watching. Hey YouTube preppers, if you enjoyed this video, here's another one that I think you might like. But before you click on it, I wanted to take a moment to thank all the people on the right hand side of your screen. They help to support all the work that I do here over at Patreon.com. If you'd like to join them and get your name added to the list, the link's below.